can I open proceedings by thanking you all for coming? It's really nice to see you, and of course to thank Eileen and Neil. Um, as you know, you know the archive has been going since 1985, um, so it's been here a long time. But um, having been taken over by um, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, gifted to Yorkshire Sculpture Park in 2008, um, we're hoping to make this a much more accessible archive. You know, but we have to say, well, what is it, what's the purpose of an archive? That's what we're talking about today. Thank you, Annette. <coughs> um, right, my welcome to everybody as well. And uh, I'm going to avoid that sort of round robin where everybody goes around and sort of says who they are and what their life history is. And then by the time you get there, you've <laughs> completely forgotten. <laughs> In fact, it's a lot sooner than that. By the time we get there, I've completely <laughs> forgotten. So we'll dispense with all of that. And you'll just have to find out who each other is later on. Um, but I will introduce you to two of our in invited um, speakers, contributors today. Um, Neil Walton on my immediate left is the course leader for the Postgrad Art and Design course in Goldsmiths and first came across each other at the, the one day conference that we had as part of the anniversary celebrations up in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park Lecture Theatre a few weeks ago. and. I dare say that Neil will have one or two things, more than one or two things to contribute to the debate in due course. Um, Eileen Adams has worked with us for more years than we can count. <laughs> and I've known Eileen for even longer than that. Um, and Eileen's work extends over a whole range of art and design, architecture and educational development work and research. and not least of which, most recently, uh, a lot of work with the Campaign for Drawing as the director and you know, education advisor on the power drawing element of um, the Campaign for Drawing. So Eileen's um, experience is extensive and we're grateful for, for Eileen's presence and everything that Eileen has to say as well. So that, that'll be really useful. I mean, I mean you know, without embarrassing either Neil or Eileen, I'll just I'll just leave it there because you know the CVs are quite extensive and we could spend an afternoon just going through the CVs, but we won't do that. Um, my name's Tony Chisholm. I'm you know uh, a volunteer here along with a number of other volunteers working in the archive, having spent a good part of my professional career here running the postgrad art and design course before things changed and the college actually closed. Um, so I, I have uh, that sort of background and an ongoing and deep interest in the archive itself and all that the archive contains. And between us, not just over the last few years, and it's in no little way, largely its con continuity largely attributable to people like Leonard, who's been with the archive since its inception and has maintained um, that, uh, that connection and the archive as a functioning unit for the last 30 years. Uh, and Anna now in her other role as the direct link between Yorkshire Sculpture Park, you know, its administrat administrative structures and this as a sort of, as a, a facility um, and as curator of the, the actual archive, we, we come together as a sort of, I think, a, you know, a complementary and coherent group of people who are dedicated to using the archive and making it accessible to a broader range of people and a wider set of audiences. Um, by a broader range, we mean postgraduate groups who come from time to time to do research days, individual um, researchers engaged in PhD or MA work who want to use the, the evidence and materials that we've got there. Um, and in terms of our outreach program, which we've developed over the last uh, three or four years, trying to say, well, we've got this wealth of material here, you know, the equivalent in art education terms of Tutankhamun's tomb. Mm -hmm. But how do we make that accessible to a wider audience? And the way that we're doing that is by putting together um, exhibition materials which complement um, other exhibitions that are happening in different venues across the country 
either education institutions or galleries or museums, or even in Sheffield's term, Sean, like Sheffield's Children's Hospital have had material from, from here as well. Um, because that, in a sense, is part of its raison d'etre, as I see it. Part of the archive's raison d'etre is that it makes this material available for all sorts of display purposes, educational purposes, supporting thinking and learning and teaching in all sorts of other environments and situations. And as a consequence, it becomes more than the sum of its parts. So on one level, it's a repository. We are the, the guardians, the custodians of 150 years of art education development, which has been bequeathed to us, has been gifted to us, has been uh, deposited here on long-term loan. It comes, comes in a number of different ways, but it's here and for the foreseeable future. It's safe and safeguarded. But in order for it to be increasingly valuable and for its worth to be recognised, you know, there is a need for us to make sure that you know, those audiences um, know it's here to start with, know where we are, can find us, and can use us to support their professional development or their individual research, or for it to enhance um, other sorts of group and community activities. So that's a sort of broad background to, to the collection. We will have a handling session later, um, because today is looking at the evidence and considering the evidence. And I know that, that Neil and Eileen, in their different ways, will have a different view of how we can best use that evidence. And to perhaps give a framework and provide a framework for, for the future. And you know, the bonus of today is having you know, folks like yourselves, all of us together, just throwing ideas into the pot to see what, what emerges and, and how best we can, in a sense, bring those ideas together to give us some direction. Uh, we think we know where we're going, but more often <coughs> than not, because you're focused on other things, um, you tend to miss out on some key ideas and some essential ways forward. And that's perhaps what we would like to, to pick up on today and, and to push, push that on. Um, so, you know, this is in no way a formal setup. It's more of a sort of a discussion group amongst friends um, who, by your very presence here, would suggest that this is of interest to you as well. So therefore, you know, we'll, we'll build on that this, this afternoon and see how far, how far we can progress some of those ideas. So going back to the boxes, we do have a small handling session later. And what we've got in front is just to give you an indication of the diversity of some of the collections on the table. I've got um, two small boxes from the Franz Chizek collection and his uh, Jugend Kunstklasse um, from Vienna in the 1920s. Um, and the oldest that the child, children will be in the boxes that you see there, bearing in mind that there are multiples of these in terms of boxes and collections, will be 14. Um, there's the, the big box that contains some of the colour exercises from the Tom Hudson basic design collection. So that's all linked to the continuing process and the shift in the way that students were taught in art schools in the 60s and 70s. Um, and the, a couple of boxes from the A.E. Halliwell collection. A.E. Halliwell was an interesting person in his own right in as much as he was trained as a, a, a jewellery designer. And at Camberwell, under the uh, guidance of the then principal, William Johnston, mm. um, he shifted Halliwell sideways to set up the first industrial design course in the country. And so what we've got here is some of his industrial design work. Um, Johnston was notable you know, for giving people like Alan Davy and v Victor Pasmore and others uh, a leg up, as it were, at the time, and was very instrumental as a principal in directing the shape of art education at that time. So that work is, is interesting, not least of which because in one of the boxes... Um, it may be there, or it may be still framed up as part of another show that we've had. We've got some of the work that represents Halliwell's, as it were, 
propaganda as well as his graphic design work promoting transport companies, Transport for London, um, and, and the underground and other things. But he did some work, I think, for the Ministry of Information, and some of it is directly linked to propaganda work during the Second World War, as it would have been with his contemporary Abram Gaines, who between them were responsible for um, images which have now become iconic, such as Dig for Victory, Careless Talk Cost Lives, Walls Have Ears, all of those things that you may remember from the history books and so on. Um, so there's that. And two small boxes here, which you'll find intriguing, um, because we've got dozens of these. Leonard will correct me on the exact figures, but these are just two boxes I've pulled out for no other reason than they all deserve, I think, closer investigation as a different kind of evidence. These are diploma studies from the Royal College of Art in the 1960s. So, you know, somewhere amongst the boxes, we've got Ian Jury from Ian Jury and the Blockheads Diploma Study. We've got Vivian Westwood's, <laughs> Vivian Westwood's Diploma Study. We've got Bridget Riley's Diploma Study. Yeah. And, um, and they're, they're fascinating to look at because in amongst all of those, if you look at you know, the content apart, if you look at the presentation, <coughs> you would say, somebody ought to smack their wrists for this you know they, they they really are in you know i'm not i'm not kidding sometimes quite poorly put together for a final diploma study the mm. content is is variable and you know you can make up your own minds about it whether i've pulled out the right two boxes i don't know i just put les and i, <laughs> les and I just pulled out the first two boxes so we'll go with what with what we've got there but it's an intriguing set to just indicate what the expectations were of that that <coughs> teaching at that time in that institution for this particular component of their course. And you know, before I just pass over to, to our speakers this afternoon, if I can just say, while we're confronting the evidence this afternoon and looking how that evidence can be used for a range of different purposes, and in fact how we define what we, you know, what we identify, what we define as evidence, um, is to say that there's a collection of evidence downstairs in the gallery, which I think most of you have probably had a chance to have a quick look at. And it's the work of Mary Martin Thomas. And we're fortunate in as much as we've got her complete diploma work, as far as we know, her complete diploma work between mm. the years 1927 and 1930, when she was at York School of Art. And what you see downstairs is not only her work, but the examination papers and the course structures, and even a letter from the examiner giving her a slap on the wrist for not signing one of her pictures. Um, and all of that, because of its, its range and its connectedness, does constitute a body of evidence which offers a fuller picture of the person than perhaps just seeing illustrations or fine drawings or book designs or whatever. So all of that sort of has come together and it gives an indication of a, a particular way of teaching and how the courses were structured then, which involved drawing from the antique, understanding botany, you know, being able to name the parts in terms of anatomy, to draw from memory as well as in elements of industrial design and applied design and architecture. Now, I just wonder, Eileen and I were talking earlier, I just wonder if you confronted an art school student with that as a package today, whether they would cope with it. I don't know. <laughs> um, it may well be that they would cope very well, but I suspect some, if not many, might struggle with the demands and the requirements of, of a course of that nature, which was highly structured, in some cases prescriptive, but clearly designed to develop particular skills in terms of you know, the, the nature of uh, work and the coordination, and this is Ruskinian in itself, between hand, eye, and memory. And one of the key components mm. down there is memory drawing, um, because they were expected to um, work with those two components in parallel, you know, visualization and memory. And the architectural drawings downstairs are indications <coughs> of that. So if you look at the icon Ionic, the Doric or the Corinthian columns, 
that are part of the architectural display along the far wall as you come in and you'll see that there's a little word up in the top right hand corner which simply says memory and they would have been given maybe 20 minutes or so to study a complex piece of architectural ornament and then that would have been removed or covered over and then you would have to in order for you to pass that element of the diploma mm. to have reproduce that as accurately as you possibly could from memory and to to complement and support that there's a draft copy in one of the display cases there from Professor John Swift who was um, part of the art and design education team at Birmingham University for many years and his PhD thesis was on memory drawing in English education uh, so where it's sort of somehow or other it's just dissipated it's just fallen out of out of use as a discipline and out of understanding and out of engagement for students it's interesting to see how important and central a component just something like that was mm. if you were being trained in art schools and for your art teachers certificate in the period just between the wars and more or less immediately after the war in the in the late 40s so I apologize if that was a little bit rambling but you know in a sense some of those things needed to you know just be to, to be thrown on the table so that you've got that as a context and you know for much more informed opinion uh, and much more directed and focused I'll just sort of um, <laughs> pass over to to our friends and colleagues here and uh, I don't know in terms of batting order how you'd like to play it we haven't discussed that have we uh, but we flick a coin or shall I you I go think I had a chance before so if you would like to speak I, first I'd I be lead off I'd you, be you, happy. you gladly, are gladly. Okay. <laughs> okay and uh, actually I uh, I would have loved to have heard from you what you where you're coming from and what you do and what you're because I suspect that uh, um, uh, maybe most of you have more knowledge of the archive more experience than I do so um, but maybe I'll find that out later on um, my as, as Tony said I, uh, I'm currently course leader uh, on the PGC secondary art and design at Goldsmiths I haven't been doing that for very long I've been in post since September um, and I'm not that familiar with the archive I came here uh, for the revolution uh, event which Tony mentioned um, so I'm, what I'm bringing really is a perspective, you know, and if you like a, a predicament that I'm in as someone who's thinking about, you know, what do the students that I engage with, what do they need, you know, and I'm very much thinking about uh, looking back, making use of history. I'll say a little bit more, just I won't speak for very long, but I'll say a little bit more about exactly what brought me to the archive and why I came to that revolution event. But... Um, uh, one of the things that brought me there was this amazing exhibition by Bob and Roberta Smith, uh, The Art for All. Uh, did did, uh, did it, many of you see that? Um, yeah. It was really fantastic. So, I mean, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going I'm to do it in this way. I've got four bullet points, slogans, really kind of like horrible kind of marketing slogans I'm going to fire at you. And those are sort of ways of, of, of pulling together... Uh, thoughts about uh, about the archive uh, but there are also questions as well and they're, they're, they're these okay here's here are my slogans so one is making ourselves visible um, you can maybe kind of rate these as 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 marketing slogans if you like another one is retrieving the narrative uh, third one is widening the community and fourth one is linking generations those are my <laughs> those are my pitches uh, but they're also questions as well so I want to kind of frame them as, as questions too um, that exhibition the Bob and Roberta Smith exhibition was a fantastic way of make, making the archive visible I was talking to Anna about it earlier on um, it was a way of getting material out and on display but it was also a really really compelling way of structuring it of giving it some sort of face and identity um, uh, and the way it was all it was a collaborative work it wasn't just Bob and Roberta Smith Patrick Brill aka Patrick Brill but it was entire the entire sort of team um, feeding in ideas and putting that together so it, it was a wonderful way of making 
the archive visible. And I think that's something that I have been thinking a lot about is, you know, how do we make our subject art and design visible, especially at a time when, uh, well, an understatement, it's not getting a great deal of support from above. How do we make it visible and ensure that it remains visible? You know, this is at the time, I, I'm sure you read these headlines too, when there's discussion about extending the school day so that PE and art can be done as after school activities and you can't help feeling, well, is that a kind of prelude to, to the subject no longer being part of the formal school day? You know, we, we have to kind of worry about those things, don't we? Um, so one of the things that we do is we make things visible. That's what, as visual artists, and uh, whether, or, whether or not I'm talking about we, we can come to that later on. Um, that's one of the things that the subject does, and it makes things visible in, in a number of ways. Okay, so you could say that one of the real important functions that art and design does for schools is it makes the school visible. It makes the school visible to the local community. You know, um, If you didn't have those works of art up on the walls for parents and other uh, stakeholders to see when they visit the school, I think we would you know, our schools would be infinitely poorer as a result, you know. I was talking to some students actually recently about the history of, the importance of knowing the history of the subject and speculating that, I don't know this, but I'm, I'm going to guess this, that the biggest difference that you would notice if you saw a schoolroom in the mid 19th century to a schoolroom today is it wouldn't be a visual environment, you know. I mean, we we expect schools to be visually rich environments and the subject art and design contributes enormously to that. So so I think that the subject has that important characteristic of making visible, of making things visible. Um, the other thing which I, I mean, in the various roles that I have done in education, working, uh, visiting schools, visiting uh, trainee teachers who are learning to be teachers, visiting all those different art departments. I've also worked as a, as an examiner, uh, an A-level examiner, um, seeing lots of different schools. Is the the character of art departments? It always seems to me is so fundamentally recognisably different from the other parts of school, isn't, aren't they? You know, and when you go into an art department, one that perhaps has been sort of built up really sort of lovingly over. A number of years by a, by a, a head of art and a team, the look of that department, you know, that, that is so visually rich with all those examples of work. Not just because, you know, they haven't had time to change the displays, but you know, they've they've actually really sort of nurtured it. Um, and and if you go into the schools that are being built now, sometimes they're built by kind of corporate um, organisations. They don't have that character. They've they've lost that that feeling of the art department almost as an archive of itself you know that that's that's the sort of the rich visual environment that art departments serve so the question i want to just sort of leave with that little bullet point is is it visual is it when we we talk about making it making it visible making ourselves visible are we talking about visual art are we only talking about visual art because one of the questions for the archive is are we talking about only visual art or are we talking about the arts in general you know and can we tell a story of this subject without talking about the arts you know when so many of the really significant educators have thought about the arts as a whole um so does it does it uh, does it do a kind of disservice to the subject to to call it only visual art but then you know how broad can we be so second bullet point retrieving the narrative one of the things that Bob and Roberta Smith's exhibition did brilliantly um, was it told a kind of story. It gave you a narrative of the development of the, the pedagogy of the subject, you know, and, uh, you know, it was, in a sense, it was a kind of reimagined history. So these characters that you saw there, Marion Richardson as a kind of willowy figure next to this stocky Franz Chizek figure, and uh, and then Tom Hudson as a kind of, is a kind of groovy, <laughs> he had his fez and his inflatable Fender guitar. And, you know, uh, it was a wonderful way of visualising this this story, this narrative. Um, and I think this idea that, that our subject uh, has a, 
a history, a significant history, is something that a lot of pressures are working to erase. You know, some of those are internal, some of them are external. Externally, you know, there are lots of pressures, like the one I mentioned about, you know, the loss of, of art departments, the pressure on curriculum time for the subject. Um, I think that that can try, that, that sort of is erasing the history, the way in which um, trainee teachers of, of the subject now don't get a huge amount of time that they can spend investigating the history of the subject. I think that's a kind of pressure. There are also kind of pressures from within, actually, oddly. Um, so some of the people who've kind of written very vividly about the subject have questioned the history of the subject, or they've they've kind of so f so for example, um, Nicholas Addison, uh, the Institute of Education, has said that uh, we're, it, the history of the subject is too Eurocentric. For example, you know it's a it's a reasonable thing to say. It's a it's a fair criticism. Or um, Penn Dalton, who's written about um, from a feminist perspective about the kinds of exclusions, historical exclusions in the subject. Um, I think are, you know, again, sort of very uh, important points. Or Dennis Atkinson from Goldsmiths, you know, is from my home turf, has written about the subject saying that actually we're kind of, we need to forget. We need to, we're, 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 we can't, we haven't mourned, we haven't moved on, you know, and there's something kind of pathological about dwelling on the past and, you know, I, I'd take issue with that. Um, so all of those pressures as well, they, they're not in themselves, they're not saying we shouldn't look at the history of the subject, but, you know, with that kind of billing, perhaps it doesn't encourage our students to go back and see it as a kind of vital, interesting, valuable source that we should really, you know, make sure we know about. Um, so I think there's a, there's a pressure there. So the question for that one is, well, is there a narrative? Is there a coherent narrative? Um, can we give it a shape that way? Uh, I think the Bob and Roberta Smith exhibition did it brilliantly. But anyway, OK, number three of four here. So we're moving on. Widening the community. This is my next bullet point. Um, everybody likes to talk about community. Now, it's sort of, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. It always gets the thumbs up, you know. Uh, it sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds very positive. Um, of course, there are those who would say, well, the his historically, um, it's been too exclusive. We need to be more inclusive. We need to make the subject relevant to young people today. Um, and obviously, in terms of the archive, we, we want more people to, to know about it. We want more people to use it. We want more people to value it. Of course we do. Um, but I think the important thing about that word community is to realise how difficult it is. You know, it really, you know, it can't be this kind of sugar-coated thing. Any kind of notion of community involves exclusions, involves a certain amount of, you know, if you like, coercion in terms of what do we include, what do we exclude. Is it a, an archive of visual art? You know, there's some artefacts about music, education, um, and that's really... You know, they, they obviously are of value and important in their own right. Is it a national archive? Where there are, I, th I believe there are items here which relate to there's some, some Russian children's artwork, mm. there's Japanese children's artwork, you know, how are we defining the notion of, of nation here as well? Incidentally, there's a conference, the national, the NSEAD conference this year is going to be talking about those notions of, uh, of diversity and inclusion um, I think that'll be a really good forum to discuss these questions as well. So I think that's a really, I think that question of of widening the community sounds like a no-brainer, sounds like we should obviously be, you know, very energetically involved in doing it. I think it, it comes with some real, really difficult questions there about what the limits are and who is the archive for, who do we involve in it, who will be excluded by that. You know, can we have that strong sense of identity um, without uh, and, and how do we decide on notions of, of of the identity? I think the answer to that is that it's. I would put forward an argument that we need to think about it in terms of a, a notion of a family with all the kind of strife and difficulties that that entails. Uh, and that that brings me to my final 
sort of heading, which is about linking generations. Um, Richard Volheim is a probably known to you all is a, a, a was a philosopher um, who wrote a lot about art and a lot about psychotherapy, and he gave a lecture in 1972, I think it was. Um, it was a memorial lecture for Maurice de Saumare. Have I said that? Maurice de Saumare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He gave a lecture called The Art Lesson, which is a, I think is a fantastic uh, lecture, a fantastic um, talk uh, about art education. And interestingly, he was, he was a little bit, uh, you know, he wasn't wholeheartedly supportive of the approach of, of Maurice de Saumare. Um, he had some really interesting things to say about it. And he gave this, I'm going to quote this, if you don't mind, just this short quotation from Richard Volheim, um, talking about how do we understand the concept of art? How do we define the concept of art? And you could say that's linked to the idea of, you know, what, how do we define our community um, as, a, as a subject? How do we define it? And, and he wrote this. He said, uh, we may think of the concept of art as a protective parent, it is in its shadow that the vast Oedipal conflict that is known as the history of art is fought out. And he added, it is a conflict in which the sons and daughters win, if they do, by becoming parents. Um, and he's alluding to all sorts of things in, in his talk there, not least his very kind of profound interest in bringing psychoanalytic perspectives to bear on uh, art and design pedagogy, something that I'm very interested in as well. I've got a training in psychotherapy and I bring that perspective to my work as well. Um, and that brings me to, to my final point here, which is why I kind of came up to that event, the revolution event, um, because John Steer was there. And John Steer, John Steer was uh, at, the, at Goldsmiths in the 1960s when a man called... Anna, man called Anton Ehrenzweig mm -hmm. was running the, the ATC in the mid-1960s. Uh, he wrote a very uh, fantastic book um, called The Hidden Order of Art, um, and he brought his psychoanalytic uh, knowledge to bear on what he did at Goldsmiths. And I just wanted to know more about that, you know. I wanted to know... Uh, I wanted to know what he did. What he essentially the course that course the ATC, the Art Teacher Certificate, in, in a sense is is the course that the current PGC is the the heir to. You know, and, you know, I'm, I don't want to in any way compare myself to Anton Ehrenzweig. You know, in a way, I want to kind of ra raise the question. You know, this this figure who I think is you know one of the really significant figures uh, in developing uh, thinking about art and design pedagogy, you know, in the mid-1960s, it got me thinking about, you know, do we make the comparisons between what we do now and what how the subject used to be taught? Do we make those comparisons? Do we make them in a sufficiently kind of questioning way, you know? If I compare what I'm doing to, to what he was doing, you know, I have to say, you know, I, I really feel like the the scope for thinking creatively, for thinking productively about the subject you know um i really question if it's still there so you know that notion that of of not having amnesia or one of the really sort of fantastic things that eileen said when i came to that event that revolution event was she said that the subject is sort of suffering from a kind of agnosia uh which is a sort of an inability to recognize things uh and you could also say amnesia as well are we forgetting just how rich and fantastic the history of this subject and its pedagogy are, is. And that's all I'm going to say. Um, Thank you, Neil. That's r really useful. It's, um, it's certainly opened up uh, quite a few avenues for, for thought and set a few challenges, <laughs> yeah. uh, for sure. Um, and that could keep us going for ages. Yeah. Um, before we go on to Eileen, um, any, any thoughts or responses from, from folks or any other questions that... Uh, that anybody wants to throw in or raise? Um, Tony, I think yes. the important thing for me, I'm fifty. I'm a volunteer. I've been a volunteer for five years, I think now. Uh, I've actually seen the wealth of material that is in the archive, and it's to me it's like an Aladdin's cave. 
because every box you open is something else that is so amazing that you haven't seen before and to me the crucial thing is getting people actually know what is here and get it used it must be used for the future it, it's such a wonderful resource mm. it mm. really really has to be mm. used Mm. Thank you, and Christine. That's why I'm yeah, today. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. Any, yeah. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? I mean, that links with one, you know, one of the key and points that uh, that Neil's Neil's just just and raised also there. It's the national art education. That's right. At the moment, this isn't yeah. this purely visual art. There is music. There is mm-hmm. education. There's Dance. philosophy. Uh, Leonard and myself have crawled about in there and moved boxes mm. about. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We know the massive wealth. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Material mm. sure. in there. Mm. I, th- I think while f- perhaps while folks are th- thinking of anything else that they, they want to throw into the mix, um, I'll just share with you, Neil, and uh, everybody else here at the moment, one of the things that Anna and I have, have used almost as a sort of touchstone. Mm in the past and it's something that we can't lay claim to but it was offered to us as a concern from uh, a a recently deceased colleague who ran the postgrad art and design course at Manchester Metropolitan University Keith Walker Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so um, he he would bring his postgrads over here for a day's study session with all of the things that we've got here and looking at the archive (coughs) and one of his concerns um, and it's one of the things that this place is ideally situated to address was when he inherited a new group each year of postgraduate students was his sorry their lack of knowledge mm. about mm. the subject and about the the nature of teaching and learning that you're speaking about but he said what was what worried him was not what they don't know but the fact that they don't know yes. what they don't know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And where the archive plugs a gap, mm. if, if mm. indeed that's an appropriate phrase, at least it can offer mm. you know, something of those connections to enable postgrads in this case, others in a different way, mm. an opportunity to say, well, these are the other touchstones mm. mm-hmm. and the turning points of of our educational heritage mm. and of our art educational heritage and mm. that in a sense I think was, was sort of significant and it sort of it set me back and made me think did, did that at that time how do you actually bridge that particular gap and you know this is perhaps a small bridge but a bridge nonetheless and it's one as you say quite rightly Christine one that we should properly use in a, mm. in a, a, num- a number of different ways any other thoughts anybody Okay, well, I think what we'll do then, if 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 you're happy, um, and you know, do do just pitch in at any point if you think there's something that that you want to raise, because it'll be good to hear, uh, you know, a, a range of of ideas. But we'll we'll move straight on to Eileen, and uh, I I know for a fact that Eileen's got uh, <laughs> a number of things that she wants to say, <laughs> uh, just to keep the pot boiling. I oh, yeah, I'm good at that. I bring um, a different perspective, but it's it's not opposed in any way to to what Neil's been saying. Um, and my perspective is as an educator, teacher, researcher, curriculum development. Um, so I've been interested in my own practice, but I've been interested in supporting other people's practice as well. And. I think the focus that that I've always got in my mind in relation to the archive is this focus on education. Because yes, it is art and design, but it is art and design education. So I'm interested, of course, in the practice of art and design, but I'm actually more interested in the practice of education. And I don't think there's anywhere else in the country that I could go to to be so well informed about the practice of art and design education and its history. Because there is nowhere else that actually holds the sort of uh, stuff that, that we have here. So I want to keep that in mind, that it's not art and design that we're talking about. It is art and design education. and. 
I just wonder how any educator in our subject learns about the philosophy and practice of art design education these days. I, I'm not quite sure how they access it. Are they influenced by their own teachers? Yes, of course. Have they had an excellent training in education? That's changed a lot. Do they make it up as they go along? Do professional colleagues impact on their thinking and their practice? Do they try to place their efforts in a wider historical context? And what trace will there be of their work? How, how do they contribute to the development of the field? Are they able to make a difference? So I'm, I'm looking there at the bigger picture from the individual outwards. And I think that's very evident in the holdings that the archive has, that you can see individuals' efforts at work, but you can also see how they played a part in a much larger movement at a particular time. And I'm interested in um, what is the point of an archive? What, what value do the holdings have? How does it benefit the individual? How are we able to contribute to it and to make it a living organism, not just a collection of historical artifacts? Um, and in considering that, yes, it contains primary material, evidential, informational, historical value, as well as Neil mentioned of objects of artistic and educational quality and professional interest. But the documents, the artworks and artifacts impressively convey the immediacy of an event or activity. They depict significant issues. They impart a sense of the subject or of the people who were the originators. And I think that's so evident in the present exhibition, Mary Martin Thomas. And I don't think that the impact of those sorts of documents, I think that's lost if we say, all right, we'll just digitize it all and people can access it easily through the internet. I think the power of seeing the originals is, is much greater. Um, so if we look at, say, the functions, what is the, archi uh, the archive for? Um, it contains documents, materials relating to thoughts and activities of a particular group, educators, creating a body of knowledge that makes up a professional domain. So I think that that's, that's a key thing that we've got to recognise, that otherwise um, so many bits are dissipated around the place. And here we have a collection um, that is coherent and can be recognised as a professional domain. It contains a, a diverse documentary record, a body of knowledge generated by practitioners and validated by experts in the field. The professional knowledge grounded in well-established theories, conceptual themes that give intellectual coherence to specific facts and events so that we can see how things are contextualized and it enables us better to understand the people involved and the sorts of activities in which they were engaged. So we've got a professional domain, we've got a documentary record of that and thus it provides a body of knowledge about practice, good practice and other sorts of practice and I think we need to make better use of that to inform and support our work. I think it provides a context for our work, fostering a sense of a professional community so that we don't exist in a vacuum, that nothing comes from nothing. There is a whole history of people who've gone before us and who will follow us and we're part of something that has been alive, hopefully will continue to be alive, but might actually change um, in terms of where it operates with the threats that we're now facing.
but I think uh, the archive can strengthen pride on a, a shared experience and documented history. And what I find very significant about the archive, it links practice with theory. It's not a gallery of kids' work that you don't know <coughs> what it means. You can see the underpinning and the, the work of students is presented as evidence, not just of their activity, but of the thinking that underpinned it. And I think this is Im really important. So there's not just evidence of practice and writing on theory, but we've been made aware through the archive of the issues that have concerned art educators over the years, the arguments made, the battles won and lost. And I'm very aware of that in terms of the period that I've been involved in art education, um, that you know we're losing a lot of battles at the minute. And again, mm. I think the archive has a part to play in, in protecting us. It provides uh, convincing evidence of the development of art and design education. And I think this should be used um, more effectively in advocacy of our subject, as, as Neil alluded to. But what is interesting is that the archive is not neutral or objective protector and transmitter of information. It shapes and interprets the sources as well. And in every exhibition that Tony and Les <laughs> do, they are editing history. They are creating a particular narrative and it might be accurate, might not be, but it's, it's a particular um, act of curation to do that, that you are creating a history. And I think we should recognize that because again, Rebe um, alluding to um, uh, the um, uh, Roberta Smith's exhibition, um, I had a very different view of the history that I've lived through. Mm. And uh, so I think we've got to be aware of that, that history is continually rewritten and reconstructed and reinterpreted. And I think the archive has got a very important uh, part to play there. And I see it as a living organism. I think it helps us define our own professional identity and have some reassurance of our continued memory through sharing personal documentation. When I view uh, exhibitions or uh, collections, I can see where I'm coming from because of the traces that I can recognize in the work of others that I wasn't aware of in my own work before it's staring me straight in the face. And I had two moments like that. One was in Sheffield when I went um, to see an exhibition of uh, Ruskin's work. And I thought, we did that, we did that, we did that. <laughs> I hadn't understood that my own art education as a pupil had been so influenced mm -hmm. by Ruskin's thinking. Mm -hmm. And then today, when I was looking at the Mary Mary uh, uh, Thompson exhibition, Mary Martin Thomas exhibition, I'm getting too excited now. <laughs> um, then it dawned on me that my art teacher must have been trained in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And she'd gone through all that stuff and we had done very echoes of the stuff. Mm. And one of the things that um, uh, I found very true is that art and design teachers, when they first start teaching, they teach a watered down version of their own professional training. What else can they teach, mm. you know? And uh, so I think that raises questions about the nature of professional education, professional formation, and professional in-service um, work uh, that the archive um, uh, might be involved in. And then in terms of local importance, the archive has great potential for the, uh, the reuse and uh, redevelopment of the Breton Hall estate. 
its contribution to an arts campus will provide wonderful learning and, and uh, creative opportunities, not just for university students and trainee and in-service teachers, but also for wider public access. And in terms of national importance, my view is that the archive occupies a unique and pivotal position in the relationship between the world of art and design and the world of education. That's its USP. It, there is no other organization. Something like the, the um, uh, NSEAD, National Society for Education, Art and Design, it mm. represents professional interests, whereas the archive, I think, can go beyond that in terms of the field of art and design education. So I think this is very significant. So in terms of the value of the archive, you might um, glean that I'm uh, totally aware of its significance, its importance to me personally, its importance to um, uh, trainee teachers and in-service teachers to support their uh, professional work. And I think it's significant in terms of promoting the field of art and design education, because I don't think there's any other source that people can um, uh, glean um, so much about their professional practice. So I'm making a distinction between their um, uh, uh, expertise in art and design and their expertise in education. So in terms of where we go from here with the, the archive, how can it demonstrate the contribution it can make to better outcomes for, for individuals, for communities, for the field? In its approach to funding agencies, and I'm thinking government agencies, charitable trusts, individual benefactors, all right, it needs to make clear its mission, its long-term goals, its medium or short-term operational objectives. I'm sure it's got all that worked out. But I do think there's got to be maybe rethinking about the community it serves. Who is the archive for? And I'm seeing it primarily for professional educators, but then I think there's so much dependent on the critical mass of support that they get from outside. And that's what we are in need of these days. And then I'm thinking about governance <coughs> and the alliances and the collaborations that the archive will have to make to, to um, <coughs> continue. <coughs> its way of working, internal consideration, the management, the people involved, <coughs> staffing, volunteers, internships, champions, who, who is the archive in terms of the, the personnel? And then the thing that, that um, really is the, the one that people are so concerned with these days is publicity, marketing, and media profile. That's a whole other ball game in itself, isn't it? And then the services that it's already providing, but how can they be extended unless you can extend the personnel? So it's all chicken and egg stuff, isn't it? In terms of um, the sorts of activities which could generate revenue uh, for investment back into to core activities of supporting and extending the archive. But, you know, where do you start with that? So my view is that the archive is incredibly important for individuals and for the profession as a whole. But um, in order to, it's like any business these days, to survive you have to expand and extend and to diversify. And these are the challenges it faced. But I hope that it's done it for 30 years, it survived. And I hope that we can find ways that um, it, we can support the archive and the archive can continue to support art and design educators. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, yeah.
really interesting. Lots, lots of really, really useful things to focus on, um, for sure. It's. Um, yeah. Tony, I don't I, know. I know my head's in a turmoil. Well, yeah. I've I've written down uh, Neil's four points, which, funnily enough, correspond with correspond. yours. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. Do people want bits of paper? I've got the ten points written Ooh, yeah. down that oh, would okay. find it. We easy. could leave those there, and folks can collect them. Eileen. Well, they might just want might, to yep, cross them out then. and add to them. Cross yeah. them around. Yeah. Okay. If we can have the papers together at some point, we'll put a little publication together. Neil, right. Okay, okay. I'll, yes, yeah. write it yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, cheers. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does it? Does anybody want to to raise any other any other thought or or make any other comment about what what Neil said or what Eileen's just just said? I'm, yeah. quite, I mean, I'm not from this background at all. I, 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 you know, I've, been, I've volunteered very much in the community in Wakefield, and, and I've been a school governor for several years. And I've tried, you know, Chris is my wife, and I've tried to think how can we integrate the value of this, the great value of this, and get that into schools, and how do we become relevant to schools so they will want to work with it. So it's how to get that information out, first of all, that it is here, yeah. what, what it consists of, mm -hmm. and, and what's available. So that whatever ideas come from school and from individual teachers, how can they tap into it and how can they access it? So I think there's a value in it as well for children to, to see as to what children produce yeah. in mm. times gone by. Mm. Particularly when they look uh, as a whole at certain aspects of uh, history uh, and it can be part of that. So not just mm. looking as an individual yeah. subject, but as part mm. of a, as a whole concept of, say, looking at the 1920s or 30s what did the children do? What did the classrooms look like? How mm. did they learn about these things? Uh, and what details in that? And, and, and what I found as a school governor is being, that, you know, there is great depth in what is taught these days. And I think there's some fantastic teachers out there which would, who would take advantage of this. But it's how to get that to mm. them to say, mm. look, there's something, I mean, it is a gem that's hidden away, really, yep. in that how do we make that knowledge available? And I think that's the first step, really, is then once we've sort of start to tap into one audience, and I think that's only one audience, is uh, how do we make that available to them and try to illustrate, look, what do you want from it? Mm. Once they know what's here, try to sound out from them as to how they'll access it, what they want from it. Do they want it to go to school? Mm. Do they want mm. to do this in school or do it here or at a similar venue so they can try and get you know a, a bigger picture across? Because the problem is that your schools and travelling is a cost in that. Mm. Uh, they are reluctant to do it because the bus is a major cost and all that kind of thing. I worked on nature reserves, teaching children nature reserves, things like this, and this is all the issue that comes with that. So it would have to be something perhaps that could go to schools. And I know when we've talked previously about one education in the past, whose name is something in mind, but taking art into schools, making them aware of the mm -hmm. great artwork which did exist, to illustrate examples of that. Could that be a first step? Could that be a step to get into schools first and to try and... <coughs> create some small pilot projects to say, look, mm. let's see how this is responded to, let's mm. see what advantage mm. is taken of this, uh, and, and just try and move with it, not have a fixed programme as to where it's going to go, but let's mm. get in there first and mm. just see where Absolutely. it goes from there. Do you know, I think that's such an important point because these days it seems to me that kids are always presented with the work of professional artists and illustrators, very high standard, finished works, they never see work in progress and sketchbooks and mistakes and all that. And they're always encouraged to, to compare their work with this. Well, it's, it's not fair, you know, it's just not right. And I've noticed as a teacher, when um, there would be exhibitions of, of kids' work in the school, then that would cause discussion amongst the pupils. When I showed them slideshows in those days of kids' work from other places, they were absolutely, mm. totally engaged. Oh yes, that's, that's really. Don't true. you think? Absolutely, it's and uh, I, th I mean, one of the problems I think we, uh, I'm probably would have been uh, as guilty of it as as anybody in my teaching career is, we tend to make these kind of rather lazy, reductive assumptions about what feels relevant to young people today. You know, oh well, it has to be something that's sort of part of their world. But actually, we, Anna was showing me downstairs the the work of of school children, kind of poster designs. You know, 
And you can't second guess what children will find engaging. I bet if you mm. showed them that work mm. and you said, this is by a school child, mm. you know, mm. decades and decades of that, they'd mm. be absolutely yeah. fascinated by mm. just seeing yeah. that. Because I, I, I'm lucky enough to go into quite a few schools. I yeah. I speaking on behalf of the Wooden Trust. And I go into oh, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. But what it does is I go into schools and I see the artwork on corridors. Yeah. yeah. And you can see the huge range of quality. Yeah. And some schools, uh, when you walk down a corridor, it just blows you away. Yeah. With the, yeah. the obviously, skill of the teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The quality of what the kids are producing, but how it's being taught, mm. because there's this encouragement sometimes right through school mm. towards mm. artwork and encouraging you know that kids to get involved and mm. try. Mm. Uh, and an example which we're doing in the next couple of weeks on 12th of April, uh, uh, we get kids from local schools to go into our park, which we've oh, yeah. involvement with. Uh -huh. But also, it's a historic park, it's a great tourist park, yes, but we want the kids to access the park. And the kids have been encouraged to do posters about their favourite parts yeah. of the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just from their own interest, but mm -hmm. how would they express that mm -hmm. to someone else? Mm -hmm. So it's about self expression, yes, but it's how to communicate, yes. Mm -hmm. There's so many. You know, offshoot benefits from this that oh, aren't yeah. just about the skill of art. Yes, yeah. that's important. But how do you express yourself? And I mm -hmm. think that's when we talk about community. I'm thinking about community as, as the sure, world community. of course, yeah, absolutely. The real value in everything that we're doing. But again, just get some of this information out there and yeah. just say, look, how can we, how can we develop this? And I don't think, I don't think we're particularly, we don't know what's going to work yet. No, I agree. It's starting, really. Mm. And, and I really, you know, the point you make there about the community, when I was saying about sort of making the subject, making, uh, being made visible, I think it's about um, art departments sort of being a really important link with the communities that surround the school, you know, because it is one of those ways that, you know, just a parent comes in and sees work on the walls or you know they, you, there might be an exhibition that's organized in the local library or something like that such a brilliant and valuable way to make a what happens in schools visible well, to well, to parents and others yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely three or four years we've, we've done it for a few years yeah. this mainly aimed at year twos yeah juniors. yeah yeah but the year two they're to express enough but then to come back and it, that art then is sent to the local management of parks and yeah. things like this to say, look, this is where the kids are thinking. Yeah, yeah. This is what they'd like to see. Yeah. This is what they, you know, this is the, we talk yeah. about the history of the park, that kind of thing, because they go about that as mm, well. Mm. They help them to express that, and then two years later, they can see in year four, and they come back again. Mm, mm. Your, your commitment and your vision of what mm, you want mm. has now turned into something real. Mm, mm, mm. So instead of using just words, mm. we're using that artwork to say, look, this is what we'd like mm. to see as a community, and from mm. those children, they have a voice mm. as much as everybody sure. else. Mm. So it's a, it's a good communication tool, yes. Yeah. Mm. But it's a way of starting that process of saying, look, don't be afraid of using those skills. Mm. Don't be afraid no, of absolutely. expressing mm. what you want mm. to, mm. you want to show. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not grit work. No, it's really helpful. But there's a real yeah. value in yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and absolutely. There's, I think the big issue there is how do we value kids' work? Yeah. Mm. And I've been visiting schools, and the one of the biggest shocks I've had in the last few years is going into primary schools, and where you used to see lots of exhibitions of kids' work, now you see professionally designed posters mm. about, you know, I don't know, the planets or something or other, um, but the children's work uh, seems to me to be pushed more and more aside, mm. maybe because of the you know easy uh, accessibility and availability of the, this commercially produced stuff. But then the biggest shock was to go into an academy in London, mm. secondary school, and um, to see commercially produced stuff. All right, kids work in the studios, but lists of do's and don'ts about what the kids were expected to do and learn and know. It was all skills based. Mm. There's nothing about thinking about what you're doing and having a voice. Mm. No. It, so I think we've got to find ways that we've got to circumvent current it, pressures on the system mm. and to, to value what we do more greatly and to encourage other people to value it as well. Absolutely. Mm. In defence of professional art in schools and, you know, having come from a teaching background myself, I know the importance of children's work because I've vested a lot of time in, in that over the years. But, uh, you, know, you know, we're sitting in an institution here that was largely the vision of um, Sir Alec Clegg mm. um, as the Chief Education Officer of the West Riding of Yorkshire. 
from 1947 onwards and he and his other colleagues, one of whom still volunteers at the archive here, set up the Education Resources Service which made collections of artwork and other information that was appropriate to different aspects of the curriculum available on a, a, a library lending service almost to schools and that informed both the teaching and the experience of children because of the nature and the quality of those collections. You know, they have since gone, sadly, but one of, uh, one of Clegg's overriding principles was to make sure that children in the mining villages around and deprived areas as well as some of the more affluent uh, schools in the, in the county, in the West Riding, had access to the works of key people in art as well as the arts and you know his budget and a substantial part of his energy went towards building up a collection so that a child walking down a corridor in a village school would pass a Henry Moore drawing or a Lucy Rye pot you know or a Hans Coper pot yeah. or perhaps you know a Barbara Hepworth you know maquette and you know the importation of that via Clegg to say that these things are important in the way that children engage with art but not only that start to recognize what they do in the context of you know a professional artist whose reputation is long and well established was significant and I, if I could just draw your attention where that in a sense has been encapsulated beautifully as you go downstairs into the gallery Almost immediately behind the door is an ink drawing, um, a large portrait head on newspaper from one of these disaffected pupils from one of Clegg's oh, yeah. West Riding schools. Um, mm. And the comment, well, the edited comments that we've taken out of um, Clegg's assessment of that boy and his work is well worth reading. If you read nothing else today, I'd encourage you to read that one just behind the door as you go down. And that will that will sum it up beautifully. But in terms of utilitarian provision, as well as recognizing that there is another dimension to the way that people learn and who they are, is carved in a piece of stone on on that building next door to us. Oh, yeah. And it came from Clegg's own background as a child growing up, recognizing what that balance was in the human condition. If thou of fortune be bereft, and of thy earthly store hath left two loaves sell one and with the dole buy hyacinths to feed the soul so if you ever come across the phrase loaves and hyacinths that's the balance that Cle Clegg was focusing mm. on you know? um, and that's what's important and what's fundamental to the establishment of this as a center of learning directed mm. on and by and through the arts this you know is is the legacy of a lot of that and I'll just pick up another point that either Neil or, or Eileen made. Those buildings up there were, when the college was functioning, was called the Victor Pasmore Centre. Victor Pasmore, um, well, you know, many of you will know his, his reputation. And he was an elderly man when he came to open it. And I sort of, at the time, I sort of laughed off part of his presentation speech because it wasn't very long and he was a little bit shaky. Um, but he said... Do you know what he said? I think it's a good idea to have ideas. Mm. And I sort of laughed that off at the time, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, it's just, he's, he's got it in one, mm. really. Mm. Because where do young teachers get mm. their ideas from? Mm. How do they have ideas? And in the having of those, those ideas, how do they validate them? Mm. Yeah. And if they're validating them, what are the conditions that are supporting that before they then you know, share that with children and the children it becomes part of the children's lexicon mm. part of their vocabulary mm. of understanding mm. you know mm. uh, so it's a good idea to have ideas <laughs> has anybody got any more <laughs> <laughs> yeah your turn <laughs> can I just say yeah well I'm an ex primary school teacher who taught in the West Riding schools and the West Riding schools of course put the arts at the centre, mm. not just art, but mm. music and, mm. uh, and movement and all the arts. But it's not like that now mm. in schools. Mm. Mm. And uh, 
They didn't have tax to have to be paid with then, which mm. they uh, obviously have now. But even in an infant school now, mm. my mm. daughter is here, her little boy goes to an infant school, and he has to do art homework. Well, he's in the first year junior now, but he did art homework, even through the infant school. Uh, the reason being, they've got so much to do to get them through the SATs, mm. they haven't time to mm -hmm. do the art in the class. They do minimal arts in the school, and the, the children are all doing their art at home with the parents. Now that obviously is going to vary. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. my little grandson is very lucky because he, they're very keen to help him, and they're very capable. And his parents and his grandparents, and then um, he produces some lovely work. He takes it into school. Doesn't always get discussed even mm -hmm. because of the time factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But some kiddies are not getting the mm. same. No, mm -hmm. no. Mm. that's very true. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just so sad because obviously in infant school starts with art. Mm -hmm. The first mm -hmm. communications are mm -hmm. the pictures, and then you sit down and you get them to write about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The art comes first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel for these teachers because they're so busy with the form filling and they're so mm. they've got to keep up to scratch to get mm. them through all these uh, SATs and so on. I mean, I know we're fighting against the SATs, but they're still there at the moment. Mm. Yeah. And you're right, Bill, because we it's not absolutely just the arts, right. the music, mm. of course. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're getting schools now where they haven't got time to have music lessons. Mm. No. Mm. It's they getting squeezed out. Mm. teachers going in and mm. teaching the instruments. That's right. So it's, uh, and it's and the, the worry is that you know in in not actually that many years time mm. the the people that you'll have a kind of generation of teachers who even forgot that they did do it that yes. other way mm. you yes. know mm. and then that's the problem yes. isn't it that mm. the, the memory of those those mm. practices which we I'm <laughs> assuming a little bit but we would mm. all say yeah. were so enriching for yeah. children mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, but but know, it's that memory that's important here. It's exactly what Val is, mm. you know, is focusing on. That's that's the essence of it. That's where it needs to be attended to, mm. isn't it? And you know, somehow or other, what what only what yourself and what Val is saying, it it's somehow or other coming together as you know as an essential component of understanding you know what this archive mm. can do in terms of its collective memory. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I had to put a subtitle to the exhibition downstairs, I suppose I should have said thanks for the memory. <laughs> yeah, memory. And that's really yeah. important. I mean, another, another factor here, actually, just to bear in mind, is um, I read a, you know, a frightening statistic the other day about the number of new teachers who drop out of the profession within the first few years. You know, it's a scary number. I mean, it's ridiculous, really, you know. But because of the pressure of the kind of administrative sort of aspects of the role. But part of that churn, if you like, is that, you know, that experience of teachers, you know, my my art teacher, uh, David Backus, who trained here at Bretton Hall in the 1960s, who's still my very, very, very dear close friend, you know, and, and he'd been at that school for many, many years, you know, those teachers who are in it for, for life, you know. Um, you need that kind. You need that sense of that that sense of kind of a continuity and an investment in in, in a career, and uh, you know uh, uh, that I that's that that churn of teachers kind of coming in and going out and not having a sense of the history of the practices. I think mm. you know is another aspect, isn't mm. it? I, mean, I, I, I wonder how much emphasis is put on particularly for primary school teachers on uh -huh. the arts now because mm -hmm. when my son was in top infants. I volunteered for a bit, and one time a teacher who was a mature lady, but first year of teaching, mm. very intelligent woman, and I think her mum had been a chemistry teacher. Mm. But she literally in this lesson, I sort of sat at a separate table, and I heard her she put like this vase of flowers on one table, and she said, "Who sat on there? Draw that flower." And it happened, my son was sat on there, mm. and she'd given them just a piece of paper, mm. and he, he has a very fine way of drawing, almost sort of architectural kind. Mm -hmm. of and he'd draw and he'd say, well, piece of paper, vase flower, about that small. I could, and I could see out of the corner of my eye, really concentrate, really pleased with this thing. And all she said was, draw this yeah. bunch of flowers. She t took it to him and she said, oh, he's not used the paper there, go and use more paper. And his face no. just dropped. <laughs> yeah. And by complete sort of contrast, mm. obviously there, that sort of completely demotivated mm. him. And then mm. someone else put one up and he filled the paper and it wasn't a good drawing. She said, oh, that's wonderful, that's great. And I could mm. see him looking mm. a bit confused. Mm. But then Dad had brought home, I can't remember, you know the ones with all the figures? The Dendrite ones. 
from the Ben Franklin. Is it? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe there's something in there still. He, he yeah. brought home a load of notes. Oh, yeah. Tying in with something you said about children likely to be other children's mm. artwork. Yes, yeah. And he brought that home, and, and he does struggle to have the enthusiasm to want to do anything mm. at home. He's very bright, but when he's gone to school, he's had a few bad things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even that, Dad mm. brought it. Yeah, um, yeah. So I looked and he couldn't quite believe the age of the children who he'd done these for because he'd not seen anything like that yeah, in school. Yeah. Mm. And it, he went away for about 50 minutes, but then he came back and he said he wanted to draw something. Now, he did it at a very yeah. knot. Yes, as, as yeah, yeah. Everything has to be done fast. But that had enthused him. Mm. Yeah. Whereas when I was sat in the class and this teacher, probably not wittingly but just naively, mm. Mm. had said, oh, that's not big, but she had heard <coughs> it and actually said, do it big. So he wasn't. Mm. Not following mm -hmm. any instructions, that had sort of squashed him, but then mm. just seeing other children's mm. artwork, mm. 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 it enthused him. So it's almost like the colleges know about mm. this yes. to try and fit into show the teachers and then get to schools and then obviously mm. the children. Mm. It's interesting mm. how much. I mean, I, yeah. obviously, I can't comment on that teacher. I don't know, you know, what they maybe they're just having a bad day, maybe they're <laughs> fantastic on another day, but you know, you could say that it points up that kind of approach, which is about the result, the outcome, the mm. kind of, you know, mm. there's a certain kind of criterion that, that, that has to be kind of met. And so there's a sort of, you know, just a, well, fill the page, yeah. you know, rather than attending to carefully noticing mm. what a child has done and seeing it in its own terms, you know. Mm. And, you know, I don't know what that is. You know, maybe there are pressures that make it more difficult for teachers now to just mm. take the time. I'm sure. Just to... Yeah. Just to... Yeah. Yeah. And then mm. they're clearly weighing on to the next yeah. side. Yeah. But it, but it highlights yeah. something yeah. that is... Yeah. You know, but I think, so I think, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's an essential, it's essential point. It's part of the pressures that, that exist in schools at the moment, whether it's at primary level or at secondary level. Mm. A lot of the work that you'll see in this archive, even, even the work on the staircase as you go down children would have had time to work with mm. that and they would have returned to that piece of work and they would have returned again it would have been done over time at a pace that was appropriate to the nature mm. and scale of the work whereas a lot of the experiences are being reduced to instant gratification mm. with mm. very little real meaning mm. you know, or sense of achievement in some of the activities and the you know the tasks uh, that are being I, I think that's really the most horrific but it's it's not just that they're obliged to do it you know there's there's lack of time and they've got to do admin work and that What's underpinning that is a certain ideology. Mm. And the mm. teachers don't mm. actually recognize that there is a reasoning that mm. underpins this, mm. and it might not be a good reasoning. Mm. And that's, to me, the most frightening things, mm. that it's, you know, it's, it's not God-given or whatever. Somebody somewhere has made all this up that teachers should operate, schools should operate in this way. Mm. And the teacher said, but we've got to. But, you know, the teachers in Germany in the 1930s said, we've got to do this. We've got to work in these ways that have come down from on high. It was underpinned by a Nazi ideology. Mm. And so today we've got the ideology of, of uh, really of business mm. and making money and short-term results and um, performance. For God's sake. Yeah. And this is what's informing educational practice. And yet it's, it's mm. not talked about in those terms. Mm. I think that's the most frightening thing. So that's where, yeah, unless we've got something like the archive that actually presents alternative views of the world and education, then they'll never know, you know, and we'll continue in this awful ignorance that the way that we are working is anti-educational. Right. Well, you know, in part of you, while we're talking, there's another interesting point coming out about, you know, time and things for teachers, and that is relevant, this lack of time and this panic to comply with it. Mm. it yeah. Happen government and everywhere else but, but if this was to, to, to go out to schools it would need to be out of, as an outreach situation mm. really like mm. organisations like I've been involved like with the RSPB and other sort of things like this to actually go to schools because there isn't the time for the teacher to research that information to then present it to the class or, or the right. school or whatever 
but it has to be delivered by mm. somebody who's mm. already done that research mm. and is able to mm. deliver it in, in a sort mm. of a, what shall we say, in a way that's relevant to what the teacher's wanting to mm. do as part of the curriculum. Sure. And how sure. do you fit into that? And that's mm. what we try to do from the nature point of view, mm. look at what the curriculum's trying to achieve at that particular point. How can we try and fit in with that and to help the teacher get that across, but also mm. get the message about other things mm. and, and introduce some other things coming mm. in? Yeah. I think that would be but there is yeah. a right yeah. there is a yeah. big yeah. issue yeah. here right? right if if things continue as they're doing and the arts are really removed from the school curriculum yeah. there's no point talking and directing things at teachers yeah. and then i think we have to go back to the primary educators the the parents who will have to take more responsibility for their child's education that used to be taken on by schools. But now, you know, parents are doing so much more anyway in terms of the experiences and the things they're buying kids and you know, relying on the tablets and all that to give them greater access to um, uh, learning. I, I think maybe we should be uh, looking more at um, uh, magazines and television programs and internet things that are actually um, reaching people much more directly um, because I think parents are actually taking on much broader educational responsibilities than my parents did. They left it to the teachers. Mm -hmm. They educated morally, you know, some practical stuff, etc. But they assumed that a lot would be, the schools would be responsible. But now the schools are not being responsible for it. Mm. I think that's an important feature where mm. this is sits within this country part, yeah. within this yes. part as well, is that yes, we've got schools coming, to look at the grounds as a whole, and mm. this is part of, of that establishment, really. And, mm. and how does that become mm. a really integrated part of it, where... Mm. Perhaps the, that would be part of the visit yeah. you know, to come to this and see an exhibition like we've got today, and that yeah. kind of thing. I mean, that's what we try and encourage. Yeah. Yeah. But it, again, it's a. <laughs> It's a question, and uh, yeah, I'm not making this as an excuse by any means because we're trying as hard as we possibly can to get the word out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, again, you know, we're operating, or schools are operating under all the constraints mm. that, that that you've outlined, mm. and it's 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 how you know the decision makers mm. in 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 the schools prioritise, mm. you know, things which you know we as a sort of you know, a, an audience of like-minded people would regard as being you know, essential to you know, a child's development and to their experience and to their, to their learning profile and all the rest of it. But how, you know, how that actually um, translates into you know, a visit mm. or the opportunity to access these materials becomes another logistical problem for a school mm. uh, at all sorts of levels. And, you know, just getting postgrads here for whom this should be an essential component <coughs> of their training mm, course mm. is difficult enough mm. you know mm. as as keith knew we could manage you know, like one half day visit a year for the mm. manchester postgrads mm. you know and neil and i were talking earlier <laughs> and it's you know getting getting his group up from london becomes mm. even more complex mm. Mm. you know because it has all sorts of other implications yeah. Yeah. but but you know this is their legacy. This is the mm -hmm. very thing that they should be using, mm -hmm. in a sense, if for no other reason than just to start to question mm -hmm. their practice and start to challenge some of their preconceptions mm -hmm. about what art and design teaching, what the pedagogy mm -hmm. and the actual um, nature of learning is about. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Getting people in is an ongoing challenge for us um, and we try as best we can. I mean, Anna knows this because she spends most of her time, you know, f sending emails and you know, updating databases and goodness knows what. And Leonard does in the same way. So it it actually sort of consumes a lot of time mm. connecting with all of those other groups and you know, institutions. But you know, it can only be as as successful as the people who actually mm. buy into it and, and declare that they want to use it, they, that mm. they recognise mm. the value as well. Mm. Um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. 
sure. That's it. Yeah. Mm. Are you allowed? So, if you're having someone who's coming specifically to visit the archives, are you allowed to give them a, a pass for parking? Because the large parking fee here is mm. off-putting if mm. you're not coming to mm. use all the facility. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, Anna would know that. Mm. Yes, I mean uh, we do do that with yeah. our guests. I'd like to ask Victoria what she <laughs> thinks. I knew you were looking at me. <laughs> 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 Partly because the question. Yeah, really well, yeah, it's to do with um, you know you are you know an MA student. You know, yeah. You've gone through the arts and you are an artist. How? What about your experiences, your art experiences, your art education experiences, and how would you use an archive? Oh goodness me. <laughs> um, I could spend all day talking about that, as I'm sure everybody else could who's been through um, education. I th one thing I want to say, first of all, is we're, we're here to talk about archives and education around that. But it's just indicative that we all yeah. sat around here with no spring chickens, are we? And you just think, if you're wanting to get in touch mm. with younger people to say, this is something that should be an integral part of whether it's your education or home life. You know, it's so sad that we're all older people saying, oh, this is very important. Mm. It's important to us, mm. you know. Mm. All the volunteer work that's done, mm. we treasure this because mm. we know what it is. But I think going back to points mm. that you both made, I've been into a couple of sessions at Hallam University where they were sort of recruiting or wanting to recruit young um, youngsters mm. into teaching. Mm. And I sat there and I looked and there were sort of like groups that wanted to teach primary school, they went off and did their bit. And I said, no, if I was to go into teaching, I'd want to go into the older range and over, um, so sort of 18, 19 year old. The, the, the youngsters that were wanting to teach primary and infant school, if you like, they were so young anyway. They <laughs> have no, I think that's a point that you made, mm -hmm. Arlene. It's like they have no concept of history of art. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in it. Mm -hmm. They've not had it in their life, perhaps, mm -hmm. maybe 99% of them. Um, and because art is, a soft subject, it's not seen as important for the future now. Um, it is very, very difficult, mm. and I, unless there's a total revolution, mm. which art schools used to start mm. up in the 60s, <laughs> yes. very little is going to change mm. over the next mm. generation okay. to come, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. And I think the point that you made about getting into schools. Mm showing them whether it's activities, archives and that type of thing. It's wonderful work, but from my point of view, that's showing it to children as something special, and it shouldn't be. Mm. It should be normal day-to-day -day mm. stuff mm. that they have around mm. them mm. so that they can look at it constantly mm. and appreciate it and think, Oh, I saw a vase that looked like that a few years ago, mm. or a Ruskin's mm. way of thinking. If you can't strip down a flower mm. into its component parts and draw those mm. separately, you have no idea of how to bring things mm. together mm. as a perfect picture of a flower in the end. So I do agree with mm. so much stuff that's been said, mm. but I do also appreciate how difficult it is mm. I've been a school governor as well, um, and you just think, God help them. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the point with archives is, um, uh, from where I'm standing as a, a receiving student, mm. if you like, in my final year, I've worked, but at home, we always had an arts making background. That was part of my life as a child. I'm a little bit older and an appreciation of history of things mm. um, so now as I say I'm in my fourth and final year we're finishing in June and I'm devastated by it because <laughs> <laughs> um, I really love being at, at Hallam um, there is very little about the history of art 
encompassed in my course. You can do a course on the history of art, mm. um, but I went into creative art practice because it's assessment rather than examinations. That was my choice. Um, but yeah, history of art being uh, sort of encouraged mm. to go out there and research, very difficult because it's like, here's a book, read it, and then do something completely. And it, for me, that didn't follow. It was very hard to get mm. into a, a habit of researching. But then I thought, well, actually, I am researching all the time. It's just a methodology mm. that uh, Hallam looks for, as I'm sure schools look for. Mm. So it's almost like teaching the kids, mm. right, um, if we say art, uh, not the art, the art, they will see a myriad of things on the tablets, mm. on the TV, the, mm. the things that they see every day. I think it's a case of educating those kids, whether they be young or a little bit older and just say, look, this is research, this is what your brain's taking in mm. on a daily basis. And so at some point you can spew it all out again and say, this is what I've researched. Mm. But I don't think children would be encouraged to do that now. Mm. I don't think they're encouraged to take, yeah. make a diary of what they see on a, mm. or write a diary or write. <laughs> you know, it's all <laughs> on a computer. Mm. It's because perhaps, Victoria, that sort of somehow or other, the, you know, the emphasis is, is misplaced into to, to what is valuable in terms of the actual process of, of recording and noting things down and what you call research and Eileen's done a lot of stuff on how children use and gather evidence and note taking and everything else. The example I'm reminded of was an exhibition on drawing at the Millennium Gallery in Sheffield some years ago now which was to do with drawing and different mm -hmm. approaches to drawing so there was a, a Raphael from the British Museum there was uh, an Augustus John from some other gallery. But the one that actually held my attention was, you know, the back of the envelope drawing, a scrap of paper the size of an envelope with just a few sort of small configurations and lines and angles. And it was Alec Isigonis's first idea for, oh, the, yeah. for the transverse car engine which from that envelope became the Mini, right? And that was the essence of the idea from which simply, you know, um, elaboration and development grew um, into something which has become, you know, an automobile legend and part of automobile history. But at some point, Isigonis would have sat down somewhere with just that scrap of paper that was available and thought, no, if I do it this way, this is how it'll work. It needs a transverse engine, one that we turn around at a, at a different angle, so it'll operate differently. And it's it's as sometimes as as essential and as earth shattering as that. But in terms of children, just the collecting. Kids are great collectors of things. Just the collecting of ideas mm. and the scrapbook approach, you know, is is another fascinating way of, of them actually identifying knowledge that's significant and relevant to to their experience at the time and I think you know and I think if you've got proof of that or proof I don't know I don't mean proof if if you can rest assured that children are doing that mm. from whatever origin Mm. I think it would be wonderful, but I don't think they are. No, I can't guarantee. But Eileen, Eileen and I, did, we, we trained together, um, you know, well, it was 50 years ago. We were talking last <laughs> night. 50, 50 years ago, we started college. Um, and we were talking about uh, uh, one of the lecturers there, um, uh, Mr. Lane, and about his approach to reading. And, you know, when we asked the question, what's the best way to sort of get children... To, to learn to read, thinking that we will get up, you know, a highly sophisticated philosophical treatise on the nature of reading, and, he's, <laughs> and he said, get them reading comics, yeah. get them started on comics, because, you know, the image and the word are sort of linked, they're coordinated, 
the speech bubble and the action mm. and all of the exclamations and the explosions, that's the way to engage their interest in the reading process at the outset, um, rather than any other sort of more formal structure as an approach. To and, you know, as a young student, as a 19-year-old student, you know, that was a revelation to me because I was expecting something different, <laughs> you know. Not something that actually I'd experienced as a sort of seven or eight-year-old, because that's how I learned to read, mm. was with mm. comics. Yeah. Yeah. So I think also, the, going back to the old, whether it's art school or old uh, methods of teaching, I really don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just literally, as you said, lack of time, lack of interest. The old art teachers that we've all known and loved or maybe hated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were ones that were a bit wacky, that just stood out to oh, yeah. you know, If you got all your teachers together, you yeah. can't be arty. I <laughs> wonder if that's um, still the case. And mm. no, yeah. It's rare that no, people will do that now because mm. they're all a group of, mm. you know, mm. homogenised, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm. So maybe it's a time gone by. Pardon? No. Exactly. The art teachers no. wear suits today as well. Yeah. One of the things that, that I think that you've touched on is it's going back to ideology. Yeah. And one of the biggest changes is in ideology in terms of art and design education practice that I've seen is this change from working from direct experience, direct experience of experimenting with materials, direct experience of your own life, direct experience of the world, etc., to um, mediated experience. That the first thing that kids do now when they're involved in, in making art is that they go and look at um, art, other work, uh, work by other artists. And then they reconstitute that. They do pastiche. And this is highly regarded. I can't, I can't believe, you know, because when I was a pupil, copying was, you know, verboten. That was it. You just didn't do it. It was sinful, right? Whereas now it's highly prized, right? And also um, I feel that, um, kids have been sort of disenfranchised a bit. It, we've removed them from their own experience. And we're replacing with this other stuff mm -hmm. and do a, a sort of mix and match. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the performance. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's such a change in ideology of mm -hmm. what is the nature of learning mm -hmm. and teaching how to support that learning, that to me, it's, it's the world is turned upside down that we're doing very strange things yeah. in the name of education. And I, I think totally the date, sorry. Yeah. So I Go ahead, I Vicky. totally agree, and it's like the, uh, what's the name of the film with Robin Williams in? Oh, the, I know the one, the poets, the Dead, Dead Poets Society. Society. Dead Poets Society. Oh, right, yes, yeah. 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 Mm. The, you know, that would be fantastic for all kids now, because I just think, the ones that are going to be sat in front of a tablet or computer will do that regardless. I know, I know. Because that's what they live with now. Yeah. But it's the, all the peripheral stuff, yeah. including things like archives. Yeah. So it might be mm. that mm. if one of the hooks could be to continue with this, archive now becomes a modern archive, mm. not a retrospective mm. one. Mm. And it's all about comics, mm. comic strips you know, all the heroes that they've got now, mm. the fairies and mm. goodness mm. frozen and goodness mm. knows what else, to get them mm. looking at old, mm. for a five and six year old, old is oh, yeah. mum and dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I know. Anything. But I'd like to, but could I, I, I want to make a, I want to try and make a kind of case. This is the sort mm. of idea of linking mm. generations. And if I've clocked this rightly, I think we've got kind of different generations here and you were talking about your, talking about your grandson. Um, I, I want to sort of claim that we can kind of, if we're not generous, we can persuade ourselves that children are only interested mm. in what is absolutely contemporary. But but I, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I when I you know I've got an eight-year-old son, and he seems really fascinated by things that are ancient and things that are very old. You know, mm. some very kind of old objects, and and I think it's very hard to kind of second guess what children are going to mm. find. Mm. 
uh, sort of really, really absorbing and fascinating. If you take things like kind of Frozen or Harry Potter, or they often figure these ancient characters, you know, that children find absolutely fascinating, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. they need sort of a, a link to continuity and yeah. history yeah. and things that maybe feel kind of, on the face of it, feel kind of very remote, but they connect with them in an interesting way. Mm-hmm. So, but that's yeah. got to be your hook. To yeah. Them interesting sure. And realise that there is a history. Yeah, absolutely. You know, bows yeah. and arrows were used. Yeah. But not by your granddad. <laughs> yeah. <you know>? um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe at that age, the, the perspective of time passing. Uh-huh. I can't. I can't remember thinking about stuff like that at all when I was that. Young. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But for youngsters now, everything is so quick yeah. and accessible. <coughs> sure. That's Mm. For me, it's such a fundamental difference. Mm. When we were younger, we had to ask people about yeah. stuff, mm. or read about it, mm. or look mm. at mm. it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now, it's like my computer. I don't ask for any conversation with anybody. <laughs> yeah. mm. And maybe at home, then mm. the time mm. to nurture that sense mm. of place, if you like, mm. within mm. the world, within mm. history. You know, that needs to be encouraged more by parents. I don't know. Mm. And they link in with us and they almost don't have to know that it's old. Mm. No, I think they make, children make incredible leaps, don't they? Imaginative leaps. They link things that we wouldn't link. Mm. We're showing Mm. you this because this is from years ago and we think we've got to know. We're showing you this because this is interesting and there's a way to learn. Like, for example, the pictures that Jack brought home and Jake brought past. Yeah. Didn't matter to him whether it was done last week. No, they won't have a... Sure. 50 years ago, it was just the impact. Yeah, mm. but that's mm. like reading. If you if you sit there yeah. six year old down and read, you know the the first Harry Potter book J.K. Rowling, or even yeah. like an old adult, they don't know no. the time difference that they were in. Yeah. They're just zooming. On, yeah, on the yeah, 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 yeah. So mm. it doesn't necessarily have to be that. Yeah, it, it's often completely surprising, isn't it? Mm. What they kind of find so you know they they have a connection with something yeah. that you wouldn't have guessed. You know? I think the major challenge that schools face, as you know, I think by the part of the educational challenge is teaching children how to access information, <laughs> and and that's getting faster and faster. Mm. So yeah. as, as technology moves on, yes, you need to be able to access this kind of thing, but but at the moment, how can it be accessed? I think that's a challenge for the archive. Really, the initial challenge is. How can they get to it in the first place and, and, and you know, take advantage of it? So whichever route you take, whether it's going out or then coming in, or whether it's technology is used, mm. it's how do they get that access to it? And then to getting that out there, this is how you access it. Yeah. A, a question I often pose, it just, just helps to focus the mind a bit. Um, and I- in this sense, in, in the light of what you were saying, if we if we were to say this to a broader audience, not this this audience today of interested people, but well, yes, we could. Um, but to a broader audience, if this building were to be burnt down tomorrow, what would we lose? What would we really lose? Mm. Would we lose anything? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I don't necessarily want an answer or a response, well, but I'm just posing the question. I'm very because, willing because to so, say. because somewhere in in how you respond to that in your own mind will be the, the essence of what this contains and what, what this holds. It's how you find value, I think it is. Oh, well, exactly. Well, may I <coughs> contribute a personal um, anecdote? My father was um, a wonderful educator, and he did it through stories. You know, he, he just told stories about his life or whatever. And one of the famous stories that he told was um, going on a family picnic, and this was in Scotland. So that uh, meant that they borrowed a rowing boat from a friend because they were watching the shipyards. And they rowed family and friends over uh, across the River Clyde. And they got to the other side and lots of excitement and everybody carrying things. And of course, somebody misjudged the distance from the boat to the land and as they fell into the water (laughs) the cry went up save the dumpling (laughs) and the dumpling was the equivalent of a Christmas pudding you know and I would say if it burnt down you know save the archive because it's food for thought 
And, you know, if we're not thinking about what we're doing in terms of art and design education, we may as well be, you know, just doing, I know, child minding or, you know, play school or whatever, that it doesn't have any educational value. Unless we are thinking about our actions as educators, mm. and this is the source that we should be drawing on in terms of how people have been thinking about our subject, and our subject is education, uh, then you know we may as well go and do something that we get more money for, really. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Arnie, because it, it is important. I, I, I was being sort of slightly impish in raising the question. I realise that. Um, <laughs> well, I'm sorry it prompted <laughs> such a, no, that's okay, that's a okay. deep response to me. <laughs> But, uh, it's not your suggestion. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll spend the I've had, so, I've had, I've had two, three thoughts in my life. Yeah. But, but what yeah. you need to ask is, was the dumpling safe? Naturally. Yeah. 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 It is a good question. <laughs> but we need to the know. Dumpling but, but, was saved. In, in, in terms of in terms of the preservation of all of this and other cultural artifacts and things that we regard, I'd, I'd just like to know how many people here were exercised and were upset as I was, at the destruction of Palmyra by ISIS. Mm. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, that's, that's three yeah. or 4,000 years old. And you yeah. think, well, why is that important? Why am I getting upset? Mm. You know, but I am. And I, it took me a while to work out why that was really quite upsetting me, mm. apart from the vandalism, which is upsetting in itself. Mm -hmm. But the nature of what was being lost there mm. was but crucial to the, humanity. Mm. Mm. But the insidious yeah. thing about that is that we are not being upset by the things that we are losing because we don't know we're losing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because, you know, I think that's mm. the one. Yeah. Mm. So the vote, if I read the, if I read the, you know, the sentiment of the, sentiment of the <laughs> yeah. room right there, the vote Again. is to, to keep it and make sure <laughs> not that the sprinkler down. system's working. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Because we need the dumpling and the argument. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, on that note, thank you all very much for all of those contributions. Yeah, thank um, you. From my point of view, I think that's been absolutely fascinating, invaluable, and I'm going to ask Eileen and Neil to put their notes together in whatever other form they think is appropriate, mm. because I'd like to collate these notes, and you know, if if, if we could have all of names and addresses so that we can at least distribute those to this audience, mm. but to make it available in another combined publication as part of our 30th anniversary celebrations which will go out as a more comprehensive publication with other papers that have been presented um, on the previous occasion but Neil thank you for that contribution that's um, you know really engaging and fascinating Eileen the same um, all of that experience that wealth of experience I think has just um, you know invigorated me and sort of set me you know, thinking about all sorts of things. Um, so I probably won't sleep very well tonight. But anyway. <laughs> no, I will. No, I'll, no, I'll have a glass. I will sleep. I'll sleep perfectly well tonight. Absolutely. And thank you, every, you know, to everybody else thank for your you. time and for coming and for engaging in that. And I hope it's been useful and and interesting. And so, please, if people could write on a piece of paper your email, is, or your contact details, so mm. that we can contact you, because then we can delve into the boxes. Mm. Yes, do, yes, do have a look Let's through these that. now. That's, uh, that's fine. <laughs>